All right. Implicit differentiation. Suppose we have a function. Well, it's not a function. Suppose we have an equation that looks something like x squared y plus y cubed minus x plus one equals x. That's a good equation, yeah? Yeah. Who knows what it looks like? I have no clue what it looks like. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It looks like something weird, some weird term. Um, we don't care what it looks like. We care about what the slope of the tangent line is, which is always the derivative. It's always dy dx, right? We want to find dy dx. <clears throat> so we have to take the derivative of every single piece of this equation. So the first one, probably should have written this differently. I didn't have the most complicated one first, but that's okay. We've got x squared y, which is a product of two different functions, right? x squared and y. Okay. So we're going to take the product rule, x squared times the derivative of y. And since we're taking the derivative of y with respect to x, anytime you do that, you take the derivative of y, just like you normally would, 1, and then you multiply it by dy dx. Good? Okay. So when we take the derivative, well, we're not there yet, but when we take the derivative of the y cubed, we'll have to do the same thing. So our product rule said x squared, derivative of y, and then plus y, derivative of x squared. Then we'll take our derivative of the y cubed. What should that be? 3y squared dy dx for those of you at home that couldn't hear what they said here. 3y squared dy dx. Minus 1. The plus 1 goes away. And we end up with equals 4x cubed. Everybody good with that? Yeah. All of you at home good with that? Good. Great. Wonderful. Then we gather all the terms out of dy dx. On one side and everything else on the other side. So we'll keep the x squared dy dx here and the 3y squared dy dx here. And we've got a 4x cubed. We'll add 1 and we have the minus 2xy. Let me bring that up. And then we'll factor out the dy dx and divide by. So when I factor out the dy dx, I get x squared plus 3y squared. And so that's what we divide. Can you guys hear me all right in Zoom? Yeah. Great. Implicit differentiation. Anybody have any questions on implicit differentiation? Pretty straightforward. Did we do any tangent line and normal line stuff yesterday? No? No? Okay. Um, we should talk about that real quick. We're going to talk about tangent lines and normal lines real quick. People at home. All right. So let's take an easy function. You got, anybody got a function they like that's relatively straightforward? x squared plus 3. Right, we got the function y equals x squared plus 3. We want to write the tangent line at x equals what? What do you guys want? Somebody take an x value. Four. Five. I couldn't hear what you said at home because I was yelling over you. x equals five. Perfect. How do we do this? All we do is find the point and find the The derivative so that we can find the, the, the slope of the tangent line, right? We need a point and we need a slope. Our point is 5, 28. And our slope comes from the derivative. Our derivative is 2x. We evaluate that. 5 is the I wrote another line there. 10, and so our slope is 10. 
10. So we have y minus 28 equals 10 times x minus. Easy enough? There's a bunch of those in the multiple choice, I think. Yeah? I think so. What if I asked you for the normal line? What's the difference between a normal line and a tangent line? They're perpendicular to each other. Perpendicular to each other. Good. Okay. So our normal line is perpendicular to the tangent line. So it's going to have a slope of our slope was 10. The normal line will have a slope of 1 over 10. Negative 1 over 10. Opposite reciprocal. Negative 1 10. So the equation would be y minus 28 equals negative 1 10. Minus 5. Good? Tangent line, normal line. The process is no different for any equation that you might get, right? Whether it's super simple like x squared plus 3 or something horrible and awful like the sine of the cosine of 3x squared minus 8 or something like what we just did with the implicit function. Right? Doesn't matter. Get the point, get the slope, write the equation. Everybody here good? Y'all good with that at home? Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else anybody wants to talk about with derivatives, basic derivative stuff before we start talking about integrals? People at home, anything you want to talk about with derivatives? You guys all good with derivatives? Any questions on derivatives? Cool. All right. Integrals, right? Our fun little squiggly ass, right? What does an integral do? It's basically the op inverse derivative. Yes, it is the... It's the inverse operation of the derivative. And what does it find for us? What does it find for us? It finds yeah. us an area between the x-axis and a curve. So if I ask you the integral of x squared dx from 0 to 1, all that is is it's saying take the function f of x equals x squared. And from 0 to 1, what is that area? And so in order to do that with a simple function that's just, you know, x squared or just like an x polynomial function, we just use the power rule in reverse, which means what do we do? We raise the power up by 1 and then divide by the new power. So this would be from x cubed by 1 divided by 3. Okay. And then x squared by 3. And since this has limits of integration on it, this is called a definite integral. Definite integrals come out to be specific values of area. So we will evaluate this from 0 to 1, which means we'll do 1 cubed over 3 minus 0 cubed over 3. Yeah. Good? Yes? Okay. What if we're going to do another, we're going to do another really easy one here. What if I said the integral from 0 to 1 of negative x squared? Yeah. That's talking. about this part right here, right? negative x squared. Right. Um, when we integrate that, we get negative x cubed over 3 from 0 to 1, which gives us negative 1 third minus 0. And we think, all right, that is a negative value, but area cannot be negative, right? So anytime you take an integral of something that is below the x-axis, the value of that integral will come out to be negative. So if the question asks, what's the integral? Great, get a negative number. If the question asks, what's the area between negative x squared and the x-axis, you need to take the absolute value of this thing because it was always below the x-axis. Everybody good with that here? Yeah. People at home, good with that? Good. Yeah. Yeah, all of you good? You're all good there, everybody? Are you good? Yeah. Yes. Right. Now, what happens if we have a function that crosses through the x-axis? Like, uh, like y equals 
x squared minus 1. Um, so we're looking at this. And I said I wanted to integrate this from, I said I wanted the area between y equals x squared minus 1 and the x axis. From zero to two. What's the problem with that? Part of it's below, part of it's above. Part of it's below the x axis, and part of it is above the x axis. So, what do we have to do? If we want the area, we need to. Uh, I think like add with different integers or something. Mm, different integers. Like, oh wait, um, yeah, I guess add it separately or something. Oh, we need to do two different integrals. We need to do one that's an integral from zero to here, and what is this point here? That should be x equals one. There's x equals two. So we're gonna do two separate integrals. We're gonna do the integral from zero to one of x squared minus 1. And when we do that integral, the value that we get should be negative. And so since the value we get is negative, we want to take the opposite of that to make it positive. And, and then we will add the integral from 1 to 2 of x squared minus 1. Good or no? Good. Yeah? All right. Um, do we need to do the do we need to do the integral? I mean it's basically the same integral, just with different numbers. Are we okay with that? Can we do it? Anybody here want me to do that? No. No? No? Everyone's good? All right. Okay. All right. You guys have pushed your chairs like close together. This is we've got some students here that are that are trying to get closer than six feet. Back. I'm gonna get in trouble. You guys are gonna get me in trouble. All right. Um no, I shouldn't be I shouldn't be recording that. Um <laughs> just kidding, they're not. They moved back. They were they just one was helping the other. Okay. Um Basic integrals. All right. So, what other integrals do we need to know? We need to know all the integrals of all of the trig functions. Right. So, those are just the opposite of what the integrals are for our, uh, what the uh, derivatives are for our trig function. Just the opposite of it. So, like if I asked you what's the integral of something like secant x tangent x, you would tell me that is tangent. No, secant. Plus a constant. Okay. If I ask you what's the integral of uh, secant squared x, you would tell me that is tangent x plus the constant. Plus the constant. If I said what's the integral of cosine x, you would tell me that is sine x plus constant. And so on. There is a formula sheet with all of those up in the Google Drive. It's called like integral formula sheet, something, something, something. Okay. So make sure you memorize all of them. I'm going to expect that you know them. What if, there's the fun part. What if I asked you for the integral of tangent of x? Now let's not do that one. I changed my mind. You'll find that I do that sometimes. Let's do the integral of cotangent. We'll do the easier one first. Take the integral of cotangent of x dx. That one's not on your formula sheet. Sorry, kids. What do we do? Yes, Andrew. Did you do the what? Yeah, Andrew, 
Andrew, who is present here in class, has said, let's rewrite this as cosine over sine, and then do a substitution. And this is very important because many of the integrals you will have to deal with will require you to do a simple u substitution. Okay? So if there's not a general formula that you can use, okay, you just have to rewrite it um, as, let's say, u equals one of these things that we see up there. So which thing do you want to use as u? Sine x. And there's two good reasons why we're choosing sine x. One is because it's in the denominator, and that's more complicated than being in the numerator. And the other is because I know that if I take the derivative of sine x, what do I get? I get cosine x, which is already up there. So u is going to equal sine x, du is going to be cosine x dx, and then we can re-substitute all of that crap inside of this integral. So this becomes the integral of cosine x dx, this becomes du, and the sine x in the denominator just becomes a u in the denominator. And now this integral is one that is just sitting there right there on your formula sheet. You integrate du over u or 1 over u du, and what does it become? Natural log u. That's right. You got to talk louder, though, if you're home. Natural log of the absolute value of u plus the constant. Natural log absolute value of our u is sine x. That's actually a good one that you should just sort of know and have memorized, but it comes from doing this nice little u substitution. Anybody have any questions on that? Y'all good? All right. Great. What makes tangent a little more difficult to integrate? When you try to take the derivative of cosine, you end up getting a negative integer for sine x. Exactly. Can you guys hear them on the laptop? Yeah, uh, the people in the class can hear you guys. That's good. All right. So when I take my du, when I take the derivative of cosine, I get negative sine x dx. And negative sine x dx is not what I have up there. So I have to manipulate the integral that I've written so that I do have negative sine x dx, which should be easy. I put a negative in there. Now it has a negative sine x dx. That has fundamentally changed that integral, though. So to cancel out a multiplication by negative 1, I have to also multiply by another negative 1. That should cancel out that negative, right? I put it on the outside of the integral sign, and that's fine. So this becomes negative integral. And now we've got du over u, which should give us negative natural log absolute value u plus our constant, or negative natural log absolute value. This time our u is cosine x plus our constant. You guys good at home with that? Yes. Great. This is another good one to memorize. But you can always just do it with the u substitution if you forget it. Y'all good with that here? Any issues with that here? Everyone's good. Wonderful. Are we? Is this all starting to come back to us? A little bit? Okay. Great. What if I gave you a really fun integral like the integral of the square root of 7x minus 1? Yeah. I'm going to give you all one minute and see if you can find that integral. Find that integral. Ready, go. I'm gonna try and drink some tea.
how y'all doing with that here in the class? Okay. How y'all doing with that at home? Almost done. Almost done. You guys all right there? Yeah? Oh, yeah. All right. Finished, Andrew? Yeah? All right. That's more words than you ever said when you were in my core class. Remember when I was convinced that you weren't in my core class? Yeah, yeah that was funny. It only took me like two and a half years to figure out that you actually were. Yeah, not bad. Now I know your name too. It is, it is. Probably your brother's fault. All right, what'd you guys use for your use substitution? 7x minus 1. What is du? 7dx. Do I have a 7dx? No. No. We will put a 7 in there. So we have a 7dx. I can't just multiply something by 7 because that fundamentally changes it. But I can if I also multiply it by 1 7 because that changes nothing. Everybody good there? At home, you good with that? Yes. Yep. Wonderful. So this becomes one seventh of the integral of the square root of u. And I'm going to write that as u to the one half du. Because if it's u to the one half, it makes it really easy for us to use just the power rule. What does that integrate to? Up to a power of. 3 over 2, we're going to divide by 3 over 2, so the same as multiplying by 2 over 3. And then we have to add a constant. And then we got to replace our u back with 7x minus 1. So we got 2 21st of Let's just write it in 7x minus 1. We have a plus Everybody here good with that? Do we need to do another one like that or are we good? Can we do another one? Yeah, we could do another one, sure. How about we'll do another one really similar, but we're gonna make it a we're gonna make it a definite integral this time. I'll make you guys evaluate it. Let's do an integral of the square root of Good, uh, what's the good thing here to use? Let's go with uh, let's go with two x minus one. Yeah, two x minus one. You guys good with that? Yeah. Um, let's go with from one to uh, thirteen. That'd be fun. All right, ready, go. All right. Ready, go.
You got that finished, Austin? No, not quite. Okay. All right. How y'all doing at home? Everybody good? Good. Do you have to simplify it? Oh, yeah, always. It shouldn't be that bad. I don't think. Are we ready to go through it? Some of you still working? Here or at home? Are you working at home or are you finished? Um, I think... Yeah, I'm almost done. All right. Riley, you good? Are you finished? Not done yet. Okay. You look like you were still right. right? Maybe you're like, I don't know what you're doing. Who knows? We're gonna we're gonna do this in like 20 seconds there. I guess you're both second here to finish up. So Rita, you good back there? Is it done? Not done. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Cold. Oh, okay. You looked like you were like. We got the air conditioning. We got the windows open. We got the door open. We got the fan blowing from the thing. All right, let's go through this one. What was your new substitution? 2x minus 1. 2x minus 1. What was your du? 2. 2 dx. So we'll put in a 2. And a 1 half. And we'll end up with 1 half of the integral of u to the 1 half du. Very similar to the last one. This time it's a definite integral. If we convert everything in terms of u here, we have to convert our x values of our limits into u values as well. So x is 1, u should be also 1. 2 times 1 is 1, I mean, 2 minus 1 is 1. And then if x is 13, u should be 25. 25. 26 minus 1. So very important that you do not forget to convert the limit. I bet some people forgot to convert the limit. Because some people were asking me, do we have to simplify? And I intentionally made it so that it would be very nice if you remembered to convert the limit. Uh, yeah. yeah, no problem. All right, so when we integrate u to the 1 half, once again, we'll get 1 half of 2 thirds u to the 3 halves. And now we're going to evaluate that from 1 to 25. Which becomes, I mean, it's still not real nice looking, but it could be a lot worse. Um, half of two thirds is just one third, right? And if we do 25 to the two thirds, first we square root the 25 to give us five, right? Then we cube the five to give us 125. And then with the one, one, one to the three halves is just one. So we end up with 124 thirds. I don't believe them. Oh, yeah. Are we going to be allowed to use a calculator on these questions? Like this this question? No, this question I would not give you a calculator. Oh, okay. We still have to learn how to use our calculators in quarter two, right? Quarter four, quarter two, quarter four people, right? We didn't learn to use our calculators, right? Did we? I did yeah, I think we did. Oh, we did? I thought we didn't like very well. Right. Because graphing calculator. Or like at least kind of. All right. All right, we'll figure it out. All right. We feel okay about that? Everybody feel okay about these integrals now? Should we do another one or are we okay? Should we let's do one more? Should we do one more? Just a little bit different? 
You guys want to do a definite integral or an indefinite integral? Definite. Definite integral. Okay. All right. Um, let's do. Let's, let's see. What's a good one here? Um, let's do the integral of two x times the square root of three x squared plus Ah, uh, now let's go three x squared plus four. We'll go from zero to two. That'll be good. All right, ready, go. All right. All right. Uh, what's the use substitution that you use? 3x squared plus 4. DU was 6x dx. Yeah? We had a 2x, so we needed to add a 3 in there to make that a 6x, which means we need to put a 1 third on the front. And we end up with 1 third of an integral of 2x times 3 is 6x dx. So there's our du, and once again, we substitute out everything that was inside of that square root, so it just became u to the one half. Y'all good with that here? People at home, you good with that so far? Yeah. Okay. Then we had to change our limits, so we went from x equals zero to u equals four. And we went from x equals two to u equals Everybody go with that? And then from there, we just integrated the u to the one half. We got one third, and then u to the one half becomes, again, two thirds u to the three halves. And we're now going to evaluate that for four to 15. And I don't know, what are we getting to here? That's two ninths. 15 to the three halves. So we square root the 15 to get four. Then we cube that 4 to get 64. Do the same with the 4. We square root it to get 2. Cube it to get 8. And what's that? 64 minus 8 should be 56. So 112 or 9. Good or no? Y'all get that? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Y'all got that at home? The two or three of you that ever answer there at home? No. No? What happened? I didn't math correctly. Oh, that's probably why you got the math question wrong. But you understand? For the most part. Oh, good. <laughs> do, we, do we need to do another one? <laughs> No response. Okay. Uh, Let's see if anybody else wants to. Anybody else want to do another? One? Sure. We'll make it a little more difficult. That'll be fun. Uh, this time we're just going to do an indefinite integral left. Let's do, just to make sure we got these u substitutions down good. Let's do the integral of how about, how about x? So the four times the cube root of x cubed minus y dx. That'd be a fun one. Wait, no, not x cubed. X squared. What am I thinking? X squared minus y. 
No, what am I thinking? Yeah, get that as extra. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll come up with a problem here in a second that makes sense. That's two. Let's do that. Yeah, that'll be better. That'll be much better. Let's do that. X cubed times the cube root of X squared minus one. Ready, go. All right, so we did U equals X squared minus one. That sound right to everybody? DU was 2X DX. So we needed to put in a two. We needed to put in a one half. And we have one half of an integral of X squared U to the one third DU, right? So we had 2X DX became our DU. The cube root of X squared minus one became U to the one third, but we had an X squared left over. Everybody agree that there's an X squared left over? So whenever we have that X squared left over or some term left over, we have to go back to our original U substitution so we can manipulate it and put it in terms of U. So X squared is U plus one. So we'll replace the X squared with U plus one. And then we will distribute that u to the one third. Oh, you got a u to the one half, huh, Sophie? Yeah. Should yeah. have been one third. I just, I just realized that as I was doing the problem. Wow. Then we distribute that u to the one third through everything. We end up with one half of the integral of u to the four third plus u to the one third du, and then we add it. So, U to the four thirds becomes, it goes up to seven thirds, so it becomes three sevenths U to the seven thirds, and then one third over the four thirds, and it'll be three fourths U to the four thirds, plus our constant. And then we go back in and replace all the U's with X squared minus one. We can distribute the one half for if we want, three fourteenths. X squared minus one to the seven thirds plus three eighths. X squared minus one to the four thirds plus some constant. And half of a constant is the same as a constant. Plus a two. Good or no? Everybody good? You remember doing these? Kinda, actually. Yeah, you should well, go actually, I do. That's going back to Google Classroom and like looking at all the old assignments you did <laughs> and just like refreshing your memory on some of those. Um, yeah, that'd be good. And the last thing I want to talk about today, which we have, we have enough time for, is how do we find the area between curves? Because this is going to be important to us as we start talking about volume tomorrow. How do we find the area between curves? You I have, um, y equals x. We're supposed to go through the origin. We'll pretend that goes to the origin. Y equals x and um, y equals x squared. Suppose I want to find this area. How do we find that area? Exactly. It's the integral of the upper function, which in this case is x, minus the integral of the bottom function, which is x squared. And you can write them together in the same integral. You don't have to do it in two separate integrals. If you want to do it in two separate integrals, you can, but there's, there's no reason specifically to do that. And we need to have a upper and a lower limit on this. So they intersect here at zero. Where else do they intersect? When else does x equal x squared? Well, when x is zero and when x is what? one, right? When I write from zero to one, x minus x squared. Easy enough? 
So I'd end up with x squared over 2 minus x cubed over 3, 0 to 1, a half minus a third minus a bunch of zero, and a half minus a third should be six. Good or no? Any questions or issues with that? Remember how to find the area between the curves now? Yeah. All right. What if I asked you to find the area between, let's see, what if I said this region, this region right here, let's say, let's say y equals 2x, And how about how about y equals x squared? Right? How about y equals x squared minus one? We're just going to go from zero to this intersection. How would we do that? How would we set that up? Split it into two sections um, at the x intersect. All right, so the important thing about finding the area between curves, you do not need to split it up ever. So if you are looking for the area between curves, part of it being above and part of it being below does not affect this in any way. So we can still just do the upper function minus the lower function. So it should be the integral of 2x minus x squared minus 1 dx from 0. We just add this part on these to the right of the y axis to wherever these intersect. Unfortunately, when I came up with this problem, I didn't come up with one that comes out real nicely for where they intersect. x squared minus 2x minus 1 equals 0. Um, we'll have to solve that. How do we solve that? Remember back when you were a freshman and you learned how to solve like a quadratic equation? Yeah, <laughs> how do we do that? Yeah. There's three ways. One is factor. Another is quadratic formula and another is completing the square. This one doesn't factor, so quadratic formula or completing the square. Either one is fine with me. You want to do quadratic formula? That's what you said, so that's what we're going to do. All right, x equals the opposite of b, 2 plus or minus the square root. Of b squared, so that's 4, minus 4 times a times c all over 2n, which gives us 2 plus or minus root 8, which is 2 root 2, 2, so that gives us 1 plus or minus root 2. Well, what form are we looking at? 1 plus root 2 or 1 minus root 2? Is this going to be 1 plus root 2 or 1 minus root 2? It could be plus, right? 1 minus right two, root 2 is a negative number. That's this intersection. So this is 1 plus root 2. And that's going to be a really irritating integral to evaluate. I won't ever ask you to do something like that with like a you know, 1 plus root 2 to plug into your integral. Unless it'll come out nicely, which this will not. So that's the right step. Good or no? Good. Good. People at home are good. People here are good. All right. Um, so area between curves. Find which one is above, find which one is below, and anyway. The only thing that might make it a little trickier is if uh, let's say it's a sign 
clicked on that. Let's say I want the area of the region that is between sine x and cosine x from zero to pi over two. So pi over two is when cosine has an x-intercept here. So we're looking at this plus this. Okay. And so some of the time the upper function is sine x and some of the time the upper function is cosine. Y'all agree with that? Okay. So in that case, you have to split this one into two integrals at this intersection. So this is x equals pi over four. We should know that because that comes from when does sine x equal cosine x? They equal each other at pi over four. Okay. So we take the integral from zero to pi over four. And from zero to pi over four, which function is above the other one? Cosine x is above sine x. So it's cosine x minus sine x. And then we add to that the integral from pi over 4 to pi over 2. And now sine x is above cosine x. And so sine x minus cosine x. Good? Should we evaluate it? Let's evaluate it. You guys evaluate it. Show me that you know your trig values. Evaluate it at home. Yeah, got that evaluated. Since we're almost at time, we'll 
we'll go through it together now. Yeah, even if you didn't quite finish it. So our integral of cosine should have been sine, and our integral of negative sine should have been positive cosine. So we get that from zero to pi over four. And we'll add to that the integral of sine ought to be negative cosine, and the integral of negative cosine ought to be negative sine. And that'll be from pi over four to pi over two. And here, sine of pi over four is root two over two. Cosine of pi over four is another root two over two. And we'll subtract sine of zero plus cosine of zero. And then I could, if I wanted to, factor the negative out of both of this. Right? If I factor a negative out, it just becomes minus this whole thing. So let's do that. Um, this could become a positive cosine. Cosine of pi over two is zero. Sine of pi over two is one. Subtract. Cosine of pi over four is root two over two. Sine of pi over four is another root two over two. What does that come out to be? Root two over two plus root two over two ought to be two root two over two, which is root two. Minus one. Minus another one. Minus a minus. Root two is a plus root two. We got two root two minus two. Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah. At home, you good with that? Yep. You guys good? Yeah. All right. That is basically everything I wanted to review. We're done reviewing. Um, so tomorrow we're going to pick up with volume. Um, we'll probably only spend 30 to 40 minutes talking about volume at the beginning of the period. Then I would like to go over any questions that you might have from the limit. And the derivative multiple choice that I reposted yesterday. So that's our plan. 35, 40 minutes of volume, then review of the limits and the derivative multiple choice. Sound good to everybody? All right. So do those multiple choice packets tonight. Great. Those of you in Zoom, if you have any questions, you're welcome to stay. Otherwise, you're good to go.